Good? Yeah, it's really nice, really nice to be here. Um, thank you so much to Q for inviting me. Thank you, Ray Fearing. Um, I've, I've had a great time. I've sat in on some sessions. Um, I saw the mermaid in the tank last night. Uh, <laughs> you know, as scientists, we're kind of like, what infection might she get from that stuff? But anyhow, you know, I've had lots of conversations with people about that today. <laughs> Couldn't get it off my mind. Um, anyway, uh, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. So today, uh, Ray and I talked a little bit um, when she asked me to speak. And uh, she wanted me to talk about ethics and equity and safeguards. And um, this is something that Europe takes very, very seriously. And uh, as, as um, Laura just said, I just got back from, um, from Europe, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and Norway. And uh, it's interesting. So some of what I'm going to say is reflecting the policies that are happening there that are a little bit more stringent. Of course, they come from you know where the Soviet Union was there and the surveillance. And so they, they look at it a little differently than we do. So on that note, um, thank you again. So I'm talking about AI-based teaching and learning, uh, benefits, ethics, equity, and standards. And um, so as an overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is AI and types of AI. So there's actually multiple types of AI. And I think it's good to know what types of AI undergird various products or platforms that you could be using. Then I'm going to talk about benefits, risks, um, ethics, and equity. That's really the, the bulk of the talk. I'm going to talk about policy and legal safeguards, uh, Europe and here. And then I'm going to talk about algorithmic safeguards, which is something that I um, work on really every day for the last uh, more than 20 years. I've been working in the field of uh, AI, actually. Um, then I'm going to um, instantiate some of these ideas in a platform that I've developed with my team called Inkits, Inquiry Intelligent Tutoring System for Science. And Inkblotter is an accompanying teacher dashboard that goes with it to support teachers in real-time instruction and assessment. And then I'm going to finish with what educators and students need and, and open it up for some questions. And I'm really excited. Um, so uh, what is AI? So in 2016, the Google CEO, uh, Sundar Pichar, said, AI is more important than fire or electricity. That's, that's pretty amazing, right? Do you agree? How many people agree? How many people don't agree? Most, most people don't agree. OK, interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure where I stand on that. Um, so thinking about UNICEF's definition, they say AI refers to machine-based systems that can, when given a set of human-defined obje objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions, interact with us or our environment, and adapt their behavior by learning about the context. And I would say context is a little broadly construed there, right? Um, a little, perhaps more broadly construed than they, than they say. So um, in general, there are three types of AI. There's rule-based rule knowledge engineering, there's machine learning, and there's natural language processing that undergirds things like uh, LLMs, chat GPT. So mostly that's what most folks have been talking about lately. I will come back to those three types because a lot of products use different ki kinds of AI and I want part of the takeaway to be what is what kinds of products are using what and what kinds of data do you need to know about and decisions, et cetera. So within machine learning and natural language processing, there's supervised and there's unsupervised AI. This is a really important distinction, especially for ethics. And I'm going to hit on this point really hard. So um, the hype on AI, so since uh, 2022, um, the public has heard a lot about NLP, natural language processing, because it's used in ChatGPT. So this type of AI was developed in the 80s, actually, um, headed up by somebody named Tom Landauer, who's uh, trained in computational um, linguistics. Um, actually know that guy. And the code became open source in 2022, which is why it sort of sprung, you know, sprung out and all these products de got developed around um, things that are based on NLP. And so many, many types of platforms are based on this. And a major benefit of ChatGPT for educators and people like us is that it really changed the conversation about what it means to know something. If you can simply produce 
a task or finish a task using ChatGPT, a student, for example, 100% of the task with ChatGPT, what do you really know? That's a, an important kind of pedagogical question. What does it mean to know? Like we've long s since said that, you know, parroting isn't knowing, right? Simply parroting something is not knowing. So how do you know what a student knows, especially with access to these technologies? So that's a, you're going to hear me go kind of, I'm, I'm going to talk about the benefits, but I'm going to talk about the risks. And so there's going to be a lot of going back and forth for positives and negatives here. Um, so in education, AI can offload teachers' lesson development, and I sat in on a great session yesterday. Um, it can offload your grading, for example, students' writing. So for science, this is very arduous. Um, and AI can be really helpful if the algorithms are designed well. Um, they can do the hand scoring. They can be developed from hand scoring, as they do in, in the system that I'm going to talk about. And this is important because as you all know, I also experienced this, as you're grading students' written answers and essays, your idea of what's good morphs a little bit as you read more and more of these papers, right? Um, these AI systems can provide uh, metrics in real time, how many kids have finished an activity, for example, provide simple assessment data in real time, and I'm gonna talk more about that. Um, support learners with feedback in real time. So those are all some very good benefits because there's one teacher and there's multiple students. You know, some states have like up to 50 students in a classroom, right? So in brief, AI can be, quote, the great equalizer for students learning if the algorithms are not biased. And so that's what I'm going to hone uh, heavily on in this talk. So some risks of AI. So by some, algorithms are considered to be inevitably flawed for three reasons. And inevitably is underlined or highlighted there for a specific reason. These three reasons are bias, reliance on imprecise and decontextualized data, and they're often um, claimed that they're unexplainable and unaccountable, right? So I think this probably resonates with people. But I add that if if um, algorithms are unsupervised versus supervised, that's highly problematic. So risk can lead to three types of harm. Uh, privacy harms, so for example, if students' data, uh, these are children of course, is released, that's really problematic. Um, and it's also critical because we don't necessarily want people to know who's an English language learner, who's in special education, who's from a, a racial minority, right? We don't necessarily want people to know that. Um, there's also allocation harms, and this is when opportunities and resources are held back from some groups because of the AI. And then lastly, representational harms, and this is when negative stereotypes get represented in AI, and that, of course, is, is horrible, and we have to mitigate against that risk. So here's some safeguards, and uh, there's five key areas that have been, um, that, that have been discussed among um, ethics um, scholars uh, in Europe, actually, and also FERPA has some of these safeguards in place. So the first one is uh, non-malfeasance, uh, do no harm and avoid misuse of AI, that's critical. Justice, prevent discrimination and foster diversity responsibility in safeguarding and in the use of data, transparency, that's important, providing clarity, disclosure, and accuracy uh, for inspection by multiple stakeholders, and then um, explicability, show how the algorithms operate. I think this is really important. However, I wanna point out that ethics are possibly um, not yet sufficient because many commercial platforms, for example, are not overseen by institutional review, bo review boards, like university developed platforms, for example. Um, and IRBs, institutional review boards that operate in universities, ensure privacy of students' data and ethic ethics, how the data is used, how it's stored, um, how confidentiality is maintained, et cetera. And these are very, very stringent. So at Rutgers, it's very stringent. We have a medical school at Rutgers, and so um, we're governed by a very strict IRB board. So how do algorithms seek um, to safeguard ethics and equity? So an algorithm's accuracy depends on how well 
The data used to develop and train the algorithms represent the population you are using the algorithms for, right? Now this makes sense. This refers mostly to uh, supervised versus unsupervised learning, right? So for example, if, if a drug was tested on, you know, pigs, is it a good model for you, for example, right? If it's tested on, on dogs, is it a good model for you? Well, that depends on how well it, it matches the, the physiology and uh, the biology, et cetera. So to mitigate or safeguard against bias, what you have to do is develop algorithms on diverse sets of students that are representative of the population you intend to use the algorithms for. So we have standards in computational, uh, computational work that, allow, uh, that tell us how to guide this. Um, and then once developed, what you have to do is test and validate these algorithms on what's called a held out test set so that you can then see how well the algorithms work for another new unique uh, test set. So why is supervised AI important? And I apologize for the wordiness of these slides. I'm gonna be leaving them with you and I want you to be able to go back and read them and have you know, some de degree of clarity. But so when you have a, an unsupervised algorithm, what it can do is take information from the internet and pull it in and use it to make a decision. So imagine an algorithm is sorting through, a student is working in real time in an environment, and the, the algorithm encounters what's called an edge case. That is, does Susie know it or doesn't she? So imagine like a, a science concept or a science practice, like how to interpret data from an experiment. Does Susie know it or doesn't she? The algorithm could actually look up the IP address from the computer, know the zip code, and then know that, for example, thus and such zip code has students who generally underperform in science. So I'm gonna say, the algorithm, I'm gonna say she doesn't know it. Moreover, whenever I encounter an edge case and somebody from this zip code, I'm gonna say they don't know it. Now that is horrible, right? That is extremely unfair and can't be done. So. Um, just as an example, in um, 2020, when uh, students were, uh, were not able to take the, the A1 level exams, they're like our SATs um, in the UK, um, they hired, the, the uh, parliament hired um, an AI organization to write algorithms to predict where students should go to university. Should they go to Oxford or Cambridge or should, it, should they go to a much lesser university? So what ended up happening was, um, the, the uh, group that worked on it decided that they weren't gonna use teacher data because they thought teachers are somewhat biased, okay? And so instead what they were gonna do, they were gonna put in a school factor. So, you know, use the data from the school for three years. Well, if you're Wendy or Johnny and you've outperformed your school typically, your score was brought down. And all of a sudden, you're not going to Oxford or Cambridge, you're going to a lesser school. Now, if your score was, was lower relative to your, your school's average, your score was brought up and all of a sudden, it was predicted that you should go to a better university. So you can imagine that this led to a big problem. This was actually not an AI problem because um, if they had used classical statistics and aggregated data in this way, they would have come up with the same problem. But the UK, hired, the UK Parliament hired uh, a group of people to come in and examine the, the data and the issues, and I was one of those people. So it's, it's an interesting example about what happens because you can't predict an individual from anything but that individual. That's simply not fair. So that's a, an illustration of that point. Um, so now I want to talk about INCITS. Um, this is Inquiry Intelligent Tutoring System. So as Laura said, I'm a professor of learning sciences and educational psychology at Rutgers. And I was running a big project at a former university where, um, where I used to work in Massachusetts called WPI, Worcester Polytechnic. It's a, it's a technical school. And I was running uh, several big projects for the National Science Foundation and the U.S. Department of Education. And both of those funding agencies have a a funding line for products that are platforms they really like that they want to see productized 
that they want turned into commercial products. So this is how Inkits became a commercial product. They actually, the US Department of Ed said, you should turn this into a, a product because it becomes sustainable. And then, you know, when you decide not to write grants or you don't get grants, the platform doesn't go away, right? So the federal government has a, an interest in this return on investment. So the rationale for Inkits um, in, was developed in response to poor STEM performance that we see in the United States. People are really worried about, about poor performance. Currently, I think we're about 18th worldwide. And um, you know, people are surprised, um, not, not educators, but other people are surprised when I tell them, well, we're only 18th. They just sort of assume that the US scores higher than that. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to use supervised AI, not unsupervised AI, to assess students' science competencies aligned to the next generation science standards in real time. Now, I know California is an NGSS state. Does everybody here know NGSS, the next generation science standards? Yeah, okay, great. Um, we wanted to support students in real time aligned to NGSS, and so that the agent can jump in and help them. And then we wanted to alert teachers to support them in real time for instruction because there's one teacher and 30 kids or 40 kids. How are you gonna help them as they're working in real time in science, right? So the end result of this life's work of mine since 2007, I've been doing this, and prior to that I did it for another organization, is a platform called Inc. It's Inquiry Intelligent Tutoring System and it has a teacher dashboard called Inc. Blotter. So um, it uses three types of AI. It uses all the types that I told you about, machine learning, knowledge engineering, and natural language processing, but they're all supervised algorithms, meaning that the system doesn't go out to the web and see, oh, you're from thus and such zip code, I'm gonna say you don't know it. It, it does not do that, it, it can't do that. So I'll tell you about, a little bit about the system and then I wanna drill down on some of these points that I made. So first of all, you see on the left, you see a student working in a virtual environment. This is Inkits. And they're conducting science inquiry aligned to the next generation science standards. So they form a testable question, they collect data, they interpret their data, they warrant their claims, they actually do the mathematics associated with science, and then they write claim evidence reasoning statements. While they work, Every mouse click, every time on task, everything they write, every change to a simulation, absolutely everything is, is garnered from the website, from the environment, and using a, a infrastructure for logging. As the student's working, they're scored in real time for NGSS practices, and teachers get real time reports and alerts, and I'm gonna drill down on each of these, to drive real time instruction. So their grading is done in real time, but they can also get an alert that says, hey, 80% of your kids are changing too many variables at once. Stop the class, right? While they're working, the kids get individual support from Rex, this is Rex, our dinosaur, and Rex is helping them on the practices of science. And this is um, you know, specific to their particular difficulty, all right? So I'm gonna come back to this in a second. All right, so Inkits and Inkblotter are used for classroom-based formative data on the science practices, concepts, and cross-cutting concepts, for summative data on, on these practices, concepts, and cross-cutting concepts, as a review before a semester of final exams, as a remediation or acceleration strategy for students who need it, and as a baseline for incoming students. It's also used to assess students who are not skilled at writing. So we have a lot of students in the US who are operating in a second language and that's going to increase over time. So if you're a, a Spanish speaking student, for example, how can your writing be the best way to assess what you know about science when you're operating in a second language, right? And furthermore, you know, if you're using the science score to predict if they need, if they can go into AP or what college they're gonna go to or whatever, that's highly problematic and it's not equitable. It's not fair to that student. So our system can actually tell a student, tell a student's competencies based on all of these things they do, their mouse click data, their mouse click data, and then what they write. And then a teacher can walk over and say, hey, so say for example, they've gone to chat GPT, 
and they haven't even really done the experiment, and they're just writing a claim evidence reasoning or writing their science re lab report, the teacher can go over and say, hey, you actually wrote a decent claim evidence reasoning statement. Now let's go back and do a, an experiment in Inkits to tie that together, right? Or conversely, imagine the student who's really good at science and math, like these STEM genius kids, you know the kinds of kids I'm talking about, and they're not good at writing, right? The system can tell the teacher, look at how well the student does on all these practices, which if your state has adopted, you need to reflect and report out on. And the teacher can go over and say, hey, I see how well you did on all these things. Now let Rex help you. Or let's talk about what your claim should be, what is the evidence that supports your claim, and what's your reasoning. OK, so here's a good example. I love this. This is a stock photo, of course, because we would never use pictures of actual children. So you have John. John is the kid who was the kid who's simply parroting, OK? He's catching the buzz in the classroom. He's actually not even doing the experiment. You see that? This is what we call a social loafer. And then you have Billy. Billy, look how intense he is. Look how intent he is and concentrating, right? Billy's the kind of kid who can do all this science and math, but he can't articulate it in words, right? Um, John is the kid who's kind of either catching the buzz or kind of copying. And we have data about this. We have, we've replicated this study many, many times. And uh, the US News and World Report picked up this story from me in, in 2016, that if you assess students' science competencies based on what they write, you are misassessing them between 30 to 60% of the time due to these kinds of kids, the kid who's simply parroting and you know just writing something. Um, that they're catching the buzz in the classroom, or the kid who can do all this science and can't communicate. This an ELL could be like this. They could do all this science and math, and they actually can't communicate it. So having a full range of assessments using different kinds of AI, machine learning, knowledge engineering, as well as NLP, allows teachers the assessment metrics they need to be compliant with NGSS, but also to provide real-time support. So here's a little overview of INKITS. Um, Simulation-based formative assessments, we have about 160 of these now for, for science from grade four to grade 11. These are supplemental to your curriculum, and they include the content variables based on students' misconceptions and difficulties with science practices. So you have simulations, widgets, tools, and text boxes that capture students' data and interactions in INKITS, and then the AI, that's machine learning, knowledge engineering, and NLP, acts on these data and creates assessment reports, scaffolds, alerts on, on uh, students' inquiry practices to support your pedagogical practices and help the student in real time. So again, so here's the overview. And so you see the red box is Rex. Rex is gonna help the student. And here's what the student sees. They have authentic inquiry. They have Rex as a personal tutor and they have student reports. So just to show you briefly, so they ask a question, form a hypothesis, they collect data, they analyze data. Oh, sorry, I'm not advancing the slides. Um, they analyze data, they warrant their claims with data, then they write a claim evidence reasoning statement reflecting their understanding. And we're generating assessment reports for teachers. So now if you see the red box around the reports and alerts, this is what teachers see. So teachers see um, real-time assessment reports. The dark blue on the left, the dark blue is kids who are already competent. The light blue is our kids who are getting better as they're working, so just leave them be, right? They're getting better as they work, they're working. The yellow are kids who need, to, need help, and so you would need to help those. So what we designed to go with this is a dashboard, and you see it there pictured, on the right-hand side, and this is called ink blotter. And let me show you this. So this is an, uh, an alerting dashboard, and you'll see the top alert. It says John Marcone is having trouble hypothesizing. If the teacher clicks on that, it says John Marcone is, is having trouble to understand what an independent variable is. Below that, you see what the student has done for hypothesizing, for collecting data and analyzing, and then you get a bunch of data from that day, what that student has done. A teacher could look across these alerts and say, how many of my kids, oh, a lot of kids are having trouble with collecting data or hypothesizing. 
switch to the class view and get a percentage. Wow, 80% of my kids are struggling, I better stop the class. Because you can't help 80% of the class one-on-one, -on -one, right? So um, that's the way teachers use it. Then what we added was a, uh, da a little uh, feature of the dashboard called tips. So tips are teacher inquiry practice supports. So if the teacher goes over to a student and they click on it, it helps them, gives them instructional scripts to basically help students. So I'll give you an example. So here's an example here. Um, there's four different tips, an orienting support, a conceptual support, a procedural support, and an instrumental support. If the teacher clicks on these, it will tell him or her what to do. Now these are really interesting. You can do them in this order, but I find teachers with whom we work every day, I've, I've spent my whole career working with teach, science teachers and I, I really love it because teachers find such creative ways to use our technology. I'll give you an example. So conceptual support is sort of the highest level support. It's the smallest breadcrumb you could put down, right? So you might say, well, how would you know about the effects of X and Y given your data when the student has changed too many variables at once? And you want this, the child to figure out, oh, I have to target my variable and keep the other variables the same. So we work very closely with a teacher named Angela Marksbury in Kentucky. She's one uh, science teacher of the year. And she gives the conceptual support to her kind of high-flying students. Now, a student who frustrates really easily, who generally doesn't do well in science, she wants to support that student too. So what she's done is give the instrumental support to that student. This is where she'll say to the student, well, what you need to do is target the variable you said you were gonna test and keep the rest the same and run multiple trials. And then she'll ask, how is this different from what you did before? Because then when the student explains this to her, that's what gets consolidated in long-term memory. And we've done empirical studies exactly like this. So where you ask kids, oh, what did you do? How was this different? They write about it, and then we look for transfer. And then, you know, several months later, they remember, oh, wait a second, what I have to do is target my, my variable that I said I was gonna test and keep the rest the same. So it's really uh, very fascinating to see kids work like this. All right, so Inkits and Inkblotter, um, all our materials and algorithms were developed with diverse students representing the US population. We're actually active in 50 states and, and 10 countries, um, including students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Therefore, we mitigate against bias. Um, we use supervised AI, thus these algorithms can't update themselves. They're not going, oh, you're from thus and such and I know your district doesn't do well in science because you know that's all data that's public. They can't update themselves, that's really important. Thereby addressing equity and ethics. And then all student data is fully encrypted and de-identified, thereby ensuring student pri privacy and confidentiality. And teachers are provided with rubrics and subscores for each science inquiry measure. And teacher professional development provides educators with support in interpreting student data, thereby addressing transparency and expl explicability. All right, so the benefits for um, students, and we have many papers on our website, inkits.com slash research, um, are many, and we have uh, done um, many, many, many studies for the National Science Foundation and the US Department of Education. But basically, Rex, which is governed by AI algorithms, helps kids learn key NGSS practices and apply them across topics so the kids apply them across topics and over long periods of time, tested up to 180 days. So we certainly taught them how to form a testable uh, hypothesis, how to collect data, how to interpret data, et cetera. We know that RECS supports ELLs, uh, special education learners and IEPs. I'm actually giving a presentation in a couple weeks at the New Jersey Science Conference on, the, on um, the data for special ed. We have a Spanish RECS study that we just finished, several hundred kids, and it's, the data are just beautiful, where students did really well with RECS, and then we dropped RECS out. Then they went in, the teacher went in three or four weeks later with a new content area. And those Spanish-speaking students who had had RECs did better than those Spanish-speaking students who had never had RECs. So we, we provide this bona fide empirical data. 
We know that INCITS provides critical data on competencies of doing science versus the writing, the communicating of science. And that's, of course, very important to equity, especially ELLs. Um, and it improves t uh, science uh, uh, state summative scores. And we've shown this in a number of uh, states where districts will add INCITS for, for summative prep, or they add it as a formative assessment tool and their scores go up like 20 points from one year to the next. And we have a really, there's a really nice um, Zoom uh, uh, video with Jen Lane and myself talking about this from a, a, a township called Brick in New Jersey. And then we know that students are more systematic with hands-on experimentation after using INCITS. So they actually transfer this to their hands-on experiments. And I think that's a really nice finding. So the benefits for you, for teachers, so auto scoring greatly reduces, essentially eliminates your grading time of labs, and these match human scoring with up to 95% accuracy. So they're quite accurate, which is why we were able to get our patents in INCITS. And these formative reports can be sent to your administrator, used for your report cards, et cetera. So it saves you a lot of time. Now, in terms of instruction, using alerts and tips enables teachers to give more personalized help to more students more accurately and more quickly than typical approaches. And teachers say, wow, it helped me identify students that I, that I wouldn't have given attention to. Or I didn't know that they didn't know how to collect data. I always thought the problem was on interpreting data, but now they're getting the alert on collecting data, right? So teachers know where students are having troubles and they can address that in real time. So in terms of the overall implications for assessment and instruction, this approach undergirded by patented supervised AI using machine learning, knowledge engineering, and natural language processing permits rigorous, accurate performance assessment, supports real-time instruction for teachers and real-time personalized learning for students. Students did really well at home with Rex, by the way. We have a really interesting paper. Um, and one teacher called me up, her name's Cheryl Chu, and she works in Compton, LA, and she said, Janice, what's the sauce? I have kids doing so well at home with Rex, and I'm really impressed, you know? So she's become kind of a, a lifelong research partner of ours. And also, this is an ethical, equity-oriented um, approach to learning, permitting transparency to teachers and other stakeholders. And this approach, by the way, will guide the design of future science assessments, for example, state science assessments, because the country and actually the world is moving towards um, performance assessment based on this, these kinds of AI. So moving forward, I think administrators need information on the types of AI being used in education products to make informed decisions about the AI products they adopt for their schools. I can't under, underscore this enough. Um, teachers need data literacy and teacher um, professional development. Uh, and they need uh, information on the types of data generated with AI to properly consent usage in their classrooms and to implement AI-based solutions as intended. So it's a fidelity of implementation. And students need data literacy as well to make informed decisions regarding the collection, use, and interpretation of their data. So I'm going to stop there and say thank you. And if you want to know more, you can email me or go to our website, inkits.com. You can also get a free trial. And we do a lot of teacher professional development. I love talking to teachers. Spent my whole career doing this. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to put this back up. And I'm going to ask for your questions. And thank you so much for your attention.